Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back. If you are uh, still needing a little refreshment, please feel free to help yourself as we come back into our final talk of the evening. I am uh, Allison Starrett Krauss. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Classics, and I am here to introduce a man for whom there really needs to be no introduction, <laughs> Professor James M. L. Newhard, who is the professor and chair of classics at the College of Charleston and the main organizer of this Classical Charleston event. Jim has been on the faculty here since 2003. He took a BA in classical art and archaeology and classical languages from the University of Missouri and holds a PhD in classical archaeology, oh, and an MA, uh, <laughs> from the University of Cincinnati. Here at CFC, in addition to his job as the chair of classics, a, um, a job of herding cats, if ever there was one. He is also the director for the Center for Historical Landscapes and the founding director of the archaeology program here at the College of Charleston, an interdisciplinary major program which combines faculty and classes from 10 different disciplines, classics, anthropology, geology, history, art, history, historic preservation, chemistry, biology, computer science, and mathematics. The archaeology program, which is one of Jim's many brain children on campus, reflects Professor Newhart's understanding of classical archaeology as inherently interdisciplinary and synergistic. This understanding of the discipline is also present in his extensive research profile. The majority of Dr. Newhart's research is in the area of landscape archaeology and geospatial analysis. He specializes in the survey of multi-period regions inhabited by multiple complex societies, and we like to joke around the department that he is a specialist in both of the 14th centuries. <laughs> <laughs> Most recently, Professor Newhard is the author with John Halden and Hugh Elton of Archaeology and Urban Settlement in Late Roman and Byzantine Anatolia, Utaika Avkat Beozu and its hinterland. How's my Turkish? Yeah. Okay. Uh, published just this past January by Cambridge University Press. Jim has an article forthcoming uh, in the upcoming North Dakota Humanities Quarterly, uh, which is a reflection on the position of humanities in the 21st century entitled Beyond Apologetics, Restructuring the Humanities for an Age of Austerity. And he will take some of that uh, same kind of question, uh, some of those same reflections in his talk this evening, Sustaining Classics into the 21st Century. Please welcome James Newhart. Thank you, Allison. Right. Thank, um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, so I'd like to start off uh, today by thanking the people who brought this together. Um, to the speakers who have brought a lot of insights uh, to the table, thank you very much for your presence and thank you very much for, uh, for uh, just just being here and talking with uh, everybody the last couple of days has been a real pleasure um, uh, just hanging out with y'all. Uh, to my colleagues in classics, Noel Zeiner Carmichael, Andrew Allwein, Jennifer Garish, Allison Sterrett Krauss, Sam Flores, Aaron Palmore, Jim Lomar, uh, thank you all for agreeing that this topic was worthy of exploration as part of the Classical Charleston series, now in its eighth year. Thank you, Tim Johnson, for putting that idea on the table eight years ago. Uh, to Sam, in particular, for co-organizing this co colloquium, working to develop the colloquium to promote the series to the wider discipline. Thank you so much for your assistance in, in making this very much a successful event, uh, something that certainly um, I could not do on my own. Uh, to our co-sponsors, the Sustainability Literacy Institute, the Office of Institutional Diversity, the Avery Research Center, History Department, the African American Studies Program, for your support and promotion uh, for this event. To the Teaching uh, Learning Center, especially Mike, Dr. Mike Overholt, in the IT, uh, AV Engineering Department, uh, JJ Corbett and, and Catherine Drink, uh, Drinketh for developing the means by which the colloquium has been broadcast to people across the world. 
uh, this has been a, a tremendous success, I think, on that regard. And, and thank you very much for your expertise in bringing us um, out into the internets. Uh, to the School of LCWA for its continued and constant support of this series over the years. And finally, to the Gerard family and other friends of classics without whom we would not have had the means to conceive and develop these colloquia in the first place. Finally, thanks to all of you here in Charleston and those linked via Facebook Live and Zoom uh, who have contributed and shared in this experience as well. Thank you all. And, and it is an honor uh, to close out the colloquium, but hopefully not the conversations that we've had um, in the last couple of days. So as a landscape archaeologist, um, I think about the interactions and intersections of environmental and human history. As chair of classics, I think long about the health and viability of our discipline, whether that is expressed in terms of enrollments or the number of, of our majors or larger impacts or impressions by the broader society. I'd like to note that what follows are my impressions based upon my personal observations and ruminations as, as a student advisor, mentor, educator, administrator uh, in the field, right? Um, and this, what I have to say here, is given very much in the tone of a confessional uh, and reflects either my or me and my colleagues' own successes and failures and my thoughts on how to do things better. To the extent that they ring true to the experience of others, great. To the extent that they can be countered by alternative impressions, I welcome the discussion and sharing of those experiences. Um, and as I say, oftentimes we're all feeling the elephant blind here. So. Um, what my experience and uh, uh, represent may be something completely different from what our, somebody else is saying. And, and only by the sharing of ideas uh, can we get a real sense of, of how to build a better mousetrap, if you will, to mix metaphors. So <clears throat> to begin, allow me to provide a, a means of drawing an idea from my work as an archaeologist into that as an administrator of a classics department. Um, and that is uh, resilience theory. It's a, it's a, it can be a, both a very complex and a very concept, a very basic concept. But one of the things that it basically says here is that as an organization exists over time, it gains certain efficiencies. And that's kind of that conservation K phase, if you will. Um, these efficiencies build a certain practice and a way about doing things that support normal functions and address normal responses to the environmental conditions within which the system is operating. Over time, these efficiencies build structure and in so doing, rigidity. Now, if the organization is buffeted with enough stresses beyond its capability to adjust, however, it enters into a condition of adjustment, transformation, uh, at which point we can see reorganization. Right, that's that, that O phase, right? Collapse and release, and then into the alpha phase, right? Now, the field of classics has often called itself into crisis. We love doing that. <laughs> it's, it's kind of one of our things, right? Um, <laughs> right? And, it, and it's, it's, it bemoans its imminent demise, and it's been doing that for a lot, too. We love doing that as well, right? Uh, I would suggest, however, that with the decline in the enrollments of Greek and Latin that I uh, have been seeing, uh, and that's just not the last five years, this is a 30 year at least trend, with the rise of a condition in society where the value of pure knowledge, pure science, and other such endeavors take a back seat to more applied studies, where our own view towards the discipline are increasingly bent towards acknowledging that on our um, acknowledging that we have internal compatibilities with the modern context, that we are, that is, too monochromatic, prone to usury by a system that privileges an elite worldview, right? With all these things in place, we are at a point of needed transformation. As a discipline, we cannot sit and make platitudes about our intrinsic, intrinsic value when the world simply sees those values as either of no worth or evocative of a system that is antiquated and hollow to the needs of modern society. When we gather to discuss the future of the field, the questions and topics are inevitably pipeline questions, I would say, that inherently talk about refining the system, but in many ways not challenging several central, mostly unspoken conditions within the discipline. The system that has been in effect since the early 20th century has become rigid. And there are forces surrounding us that in combination 
bring us to the point of restructuring. We are at a point of change. This is a system that privileges the pursuit of advanced studies over other career trajectories. When speaking about the future of classics, the preponderance of discussion turns to the pipeline going from undergraduate to graduate students to professional work within classics. We talk about the relevance of the canon, the extent to which languages play a part in the training of future classicists, and the types of courses or emphases that we present. What and how do we present the ancient world? What and how do we relate this material to our current world? We investigate our own demographics to check our, on diversity by race and gender, both in terms of the professorate and in terms of the students in our classes. We look at our publications and journals to ensure that a diverse perspective is presented. All of these conditions go to ensure that we are true to the subject we study, a dynamic and multicultural world system, and are encouraging a diverse perspective from the position of race and gender. Now, we are not wrong to talk about these issues, and I'll come back to some of them very shortly. What we are missing, and I believe this to be fundamental, is something alluded to by Daniel Padilla Peralta in San Diego, not within his opening remarks at the SCS panel, but hinted at in many of his responses in that same panel. It is something we've been focusing on at Charleston as well. Now, when people from an Ivy League and public undergraduate comprehensive institution are coming up with the same general thought, it's a good idea to interrogate that idea, right? That is the idea that classics is for all. Now, we say this all the time. We do. We say this all the time, right? Anyone can, anyone can and anyone should major, minor, take classes in classics. However, do we do a, we do a really bad job of demonstrating why anyone would outside of those wanting to run off to graduate school. <laughs> when we gather and talk about our programs, the questions are in regards to the number of majors, the number of students in sections in Latin and Greek, and whom we sent off to graduate school. Right? Now, is the third condition a natural outcome of the first two? In our minds, yes. How many students do you have in class in, in, in Latin and Greek? How many sections do you have? How many majors do you have? How many people are you sending off to graduate school? Who are you sending off? Where are they going? This is what we talk about when we go to those professional conferences and talk about the health of our, of our programs. Right? Why do we ask those questions? Why do we ask that last one? Right? Well, it's because we went to grad school. Right? We're often having these discussions in professional setting, talking to other professionals in the field. We don't talk about the other students who aren't potentially wandering the halls. We don't talk about our efforts to encourage classics and venues outside of our classrooms, service or outreach activities. Those topics are not salient to our research and, productive, or and productivity as academics. This translates into how we view our work when we come off the planes, back from the conferences, return to our work in our home institutions, and the values we place upon our work when we're in our back home. Right? We want to be validated by our colleagues at home and in the wider field. And what is valued is the impact we make upon the field, either through our own work or in the production of future scholars to the discipline. This is often reinforced by the expectations for tenure and promotion and for even attaining or getting a job, right? When the focus is even increasingly at non-research one institutions upon research and publications. So it's awkward when a bright, capable student comes in and states their interest is something other than grad school. We're caught flat-footed in many cases. And this is a problem, and it goes to our ability to broaden the appeal of the discipline to the widest group of people, and indeed, the overall long-term viability as a discipline. From where I sit, it seems that we have done, historically, a crappy job of mentoring and educating students who aren't going on. Again, I can't speak for other programs, for us, and I'm being brutally honest, right? While we know that only about 30% of our students are entering advanced programs in classics, our mentoring of the other 70 students until recently has been as if they received the consolation prize. Did we say, did we open any doors for them? Did we exercise any networks or connections to assist them in their professional pursuits? Not as much as we should. The intrinsic awesomeness of classics was supposedly sufficient to propel them into greatness. Show them pictures of Coldplay dude 
right? <laughs> Loki, JK, Ted Turner, world is your oyster, right? Bollocks, right? So here are some thoughts on where we go from here. All right, number one, Oop, go the other way with the slidey things, all right? Begin with the end in mind. <laughs> I said we exist on a, on a 30 70 rule. 30% of our undergraduate students go on to graduate school. I would hazard to guess that 30% of the PhDs in this country uh, find a gig in academia. The 70% likewise are not entering the, uh, the academy. What are we doing for the other 70%? We need to pay attention to the fact, the well known fact, that the majority of our current classicists are doing something other than classics to pay for food, shelter, and clothing. To that end, what are the perspectives, approaches, and skills that studying classics can develop? How do we translate a person's love for Greco-Roman civilization into food? Beyond that, how do we signpost that so people can see the relations between what we teach and its applications? So within our work at Charleston, here, we've redesigned our non-language major to emphasize the components that we think are important for any person studying the ancient Mediterranean world, right? So classics is the place where big questions can be explored. Classics is the place to hone one's ability to garner, gather and synthesize broad types of information. Classics is the place where one gets a synthetic understanding of how civilizations emerge, sustain themselves, shift into other systems over time. Classics is the place where you can learn how societies and cultures appropriate the other, for good or for ill. Classics is the place where you learn to speak, to write, and to argue. All right? So we make those things explicit. This is what you're gonna get in a classics degree, right? Roadmap a path, right? Students need more than pictures of JK, Loki, and Coldplay dude. Right? They need to not be told that they can do anything. They need to be shown. They need a pathway beyond the alabaster path to the ivory tower. If someone comes in with an interest in classical archaeology, I have an eight-point plan for moving them to the next step. Semester one, you got to do this. Semester two, you do this. All the way up to graduation. And if you fall off the little path, there are certain ways in which we can creak you back up there. But there are some times when you have fallen off the alabaster path. In which case, here's JK, uh, Loki, and uh, Coldplay Dude, right? <clears throat> Wanting, you know, if you wanna go into communications, here's a picture of Ted Turner. Uh, now you can go see career services and they'll tell you what to do with that. No, no, no. We need to create within the culminating capstone experience, right? We need to, we need to roadmap career tracks. How to get from point A to point B. Right? We need, uh, within a culminating capstone experience that so many of us require as an option, you need to have an applied classics course, an internship. Right? And, an, and not just an internship at uh, an art museum or something that is somewhat sort of classically related. I'm talking about internships in industries in which the student expresses interest of going into, right? Some other immersive experience that puts them on a pathway towards a, 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 a j -j -j job, all right? Other things, strategic minors. We all believe I'd hope that classics is an instrument, is instrumental in developing the change agents of tomorrow. However, getting the first gig is important. Minors that emphasize entry level skills in an, in an industry provides the step to their next stage, their first job. I firmly believe that classics is going to help you not just with the first job, but 10 years down the road when it's time to move on. But you're going to need some critical skills that minors, strategic minors, will help, you know, put that on the CV. Other thing I would say, data. You know, people who know me say, well, of course there's a data, there's going to be a data slide, <laughs> right? We need data. Now, despite our claims as classicists to be really good at critical analysis, we are horrible, horrible at collecting and sharing information. 
we need to be better at this. Information retrieved, I see here that I put on this, uh, made this nice little, little charty thing, right? Got this information from the Modern Language Association. Did not get this from the Society for Classical Studies. I can analyze the Greek and Latin enrollments going back into the 1950s. And when if I pair this with the public data from the Department of Education, I can delve into some really interesting information in terms of demographics um, and split everything up by all different types of institutions and enrollments and blah, 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 blah. But I can just do that for the Latin and Greek component of our programs. How do we know who's doing a good job and who's not? How can we share best practices and successful strategies if we don't know who's actually successful? <laughs> right? So I got two, two, uh, two slides here. The first one here, you see the, the nice little bit here. Uh, you've got the, national, the, the, the natural trend, if you will, for Latin with the little uh, black dotty bits. And then here's the six largest programs of 2016 for Latin and Greek. And you can see that they kind of more or less kind of follow, follow the trend from 2002 to, to, to 16, right? Except for one, Montclair is doing something weird. Like know what that, I'd, I'd like to know what's going on there, right? Um, just playing a little bit more with the numbers. So um, here's, you know, type top four programs with an increasing Latin and Greek, right? Over that same period, right? And these are programs with at least more, uh, with 35 students or more within their Latin and Greek. And you come up with a different group of folks, right? Montclair, Albright College, Mississippi State University, Missouri Baptist College, right? What are these people doing in their departments? I don't know. I want to call them up. I'm very interesting, interested to see what they're doing. I can tell you, I looked at the uh, Montclair State, uh, looked at Montclair State. They have a really good, like, website talking about the different thing, types of things that you can do with classics and on their list of things you can do with classics guess what the academy is not one of them more locally um, do we know what our alumni are doing all of them not just the ones we see in the halls at the meetings classics for all requires a network especially for those not going into the profession. We've already got that network. Local programmatic level data on placement and employment is essential for developing networks outside of the academy, mentoring students and making the case to the administrators of our institutions, the legislators, uh, for those of us who have the blessings of being at a public institution, and the general public, the classics matters. Here's all the people who get jobs, right? Spread the word. Our engagement with high and middle schools are critical. If we are discipline viewed at the high school level as elitist and only for a restricted few, it won't matter what our message is at the collegiate level. Creating a message for classics that is inclusive and valid is critical and critical early, not later. Engagement is often interpreted as a need to redouble our collaborations with K-12 Latin teachers. Engagement goes beyond this and extends to cognate studies of literature, history, and geography. In particular, connections with guidance counselors. Those are critical. Those, those <laughs> folks are the gatekeepers between middle and high school students and their decisions on what types of subjects and what types of majors they should pursue when they get into college. According to many bits of data, businesses are attuned to our skills and capacities. It is a matter for us to engage and cultivate networks with business leaders. Our colleagues in political science and communications do this. Why do we not see this as a thing? Because it doesn't relate to classics? I'm confused. When did we cede rhetoric to the communications department? The exploration of political systems to political science? I'm sorry, I thought we did that. Okay, so if we believe we have value to the world, we need to demonstrate to our students or potential students, administration and the wider public, we need to advocate actively, not just in word, but in deed, that the study of, ancient, of the ancient Mediterranean world is open for all. Right? What does this have to do with diversity? Everything. People can tell when they're being sold a fake bill of goods. If we tell them that they can do anything but don't provide resources, we're telling them that this does nothing for them. They move on. 
If they don't see themselves doing this professionally, they move on. If our discipline is in decline, if the enrollments in Latin and Greek are declining, look not upon society, look upon ourselves and the message we convey. Do we present, do we present rather a path by which to translate a love for classics into food? Or do we proclaim platitudes? Do we proclaim the applicability of the subject matter to the modern world, but yet not engage in topics or issues that are of this world? Do we proclaim the relevance of our subject to diversity in multicultural studies, but, shut, but do not show that to be a diverse instructional faculty, coursework, and research? In this day and age, the large proportion of students, my experience, don't respond to platitudes. They wanna know how to translate their studies into food. They need to see that there's a roadmap in place. Do we provide them with that? Other than that alabaster path to the ivory tower. If we reform our curricula to effectively signpost our value, create avenues for translating our discipline into food beyond the ivory tower or related disciplines, advise our students towards strategic applied skills, collect information on and exchange in best practices, communicate this vision externally, we inherently broaden our reach beyond those whom we are already attracting. This creates scale, which in turn makes discussion on a number of the points we tend to focus on somewhat moot. Do we need to reposition our voices and emphasize the multicultural nature of our subject area? Absolutely. Do we need to confront the appropriation of our subject area towards narratives that reinforce whitening and westerning? Most definitely. Do we need to encourage and provide support of minority voices within our field? Yep. Will any of these efforts matter if we maintain an ethos that privileges 30% of people who are bound towards a profession in this field? Nah. So this paper is meant to carry us out the door and towards the rolling up of our sleeves and getting enthusiastically to, into the task at hand. There should be, therefore, a hint of optimism, and I'm, I am optimistic for the future. Uh, we can do this. It is easy within our reach to shift our focus from ourselves to others around us. Will we do this? I actually think so, but I have no faith that it will be immediate. The field has shown remarkable capacity to integrate new approaches and perspectives in the past. Uh, look to feminist approaches, uh, queer studies within, within the field of classics. 30 years ago, there wasn't any of that. Now it's, it, it's, it's a part of it, right? We can do this. And there are already efforts underway to increase engagements between classics and the broader world. So a sampling I've put in, in play down here, right? The, the Classics Everywhere initiative, right? Supporting projects that engage communities with the classics. Uh, the Mountaintop Coalition, a uh, newly formed, which supports minority members of the discipline. Sportula, a, a program instituted to support disadvantaged students of classics. A wide array of blogs by the Academy, chock full of information on how to increase and develop courses on diversity and reception. And if I didn't mention any piece of information that you think is really important, it's a, a sampling, okay? All right, so don't, but th there's stuff out there, right? So I have genuine confidence that we can do this, right? Now, some would suggest that these ideas are in some ways threatening to the idea, the very idea of classics. What about the teaching of the canon? The importance of Latin and Greek, the core of classics. What we're talking about is like getting rid of that, right? I see nothing more to the core of classics than the exploration of a variety of methods to understand the past. The very concept of Alterton-Wissenschaft, and I see students rolling on their eyes right now. I just use it, yeah, yeah, I just use a term. But the very concept of Alterton-Wissenschaft was to incorporate different types of information into our understanding of the past. In those days, philology, history, and material studies. What would these early German classicists do with the types of information we have here today? What would they do with statistics, geoinformatics? Right? Classics is inherently, I mean, they were trying to gather all the information they could to, to find out something about the past, right? Well, now we've got more tools. Now we've got more approaches. Classics is inherently multi and interdisciplinary. Nothing could be more core to our discipline than embracing new methods and approaches and perspectives. Innovation comes from embracing, not running away from new approaches and perspectives. That's how we grow, that's how we develop, that's how we learn new things. 
So I have genuine confidence in our students that choose the path of inclusivity, to question openly the sources of information that we've been led to, and to seek out their own wellsprings of knowledge. If there be any doubt or apprehension in my mind, it is that, like other large systemic changes in our world, that we are either too late to the battle or too small in force to make a difference to deter the climatic change that we've brought largely upon our own selves. So, thank you. Thank you for your attendance. Oh, okay. all right, all right. All right. So, so I would just like to say again, thank you very much for your attendance and, and thank you much, very much for your participation. Um, I'm happy to entertain questions, uh, but uh, since this is we're, we're last uh, thing, uh, if there's any other questions for the other speakers, I'm happy to cede my time uh, so you can uh, ask uh, anything uh, from our, our previous speakers as well. So. They had the chance to make comments. I want to make two comments. One of them is um, I was in the State Department, and the State Department, like all federal agencies, run a, runs an intern program. And for several years, I managed the intern program at whatever embassy or consulate I was at. And um, we were not getting applications from Podunk Community College. We were getting applications from Harvard and Yale and M Madison and Michigan and you know, Berkeley and everything else. After about three years of doing this, I would take anybody that could write a simple declarative sentence. <laughs> and if they could write a paragraph. Well, we got that. No, no, but I mean, this is something that is not taught anymore is how to write. Mm -hmm. And I think classics is one of the places where you, you learn that and that's something. And the second thing is um, our granddaughter, when she asked us what she should take Latin or Spanish, I said Spanish because you'll never learn English grammar unless you take Latin. But when I quizzed her, she never read either Caesar or Cicero. And I said, that's horrible because first of all, Cicero, I mean, Caesar is simple Latin, but, but the thing about Caesar is you see a man setting himself up. <laughs> he is going on to greater things and he is, you know, setting the stage. Mm. And I said, and apart from, and Cicero was, is fun. I mean, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, putting it all together. But I said, if you ever want to learn what political assassination is, <laughs> if you ever want to learn what political language is, that's Cicero. And I said, and I don't know why classics departments you know, or, or Latin teachers don't get that. I mean, she never read anything bigger, longer than like two pages. And I said, that's not Latin. So, I mean, I, I think what you're doing is, is very, very interesting and is a place that classics ought to be going. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, thanks, and um, I will say that uh, well, here at the College of Charleston, we have an advanced uh, Latin course in, in, in Cicero going on right now, so um, that still is, is, is being taught, um, and uh, Jen, you've been doing some Caesar and some, and some Salisy typey things, little bits here and there, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's definitely still things that we do, um, and so um, when people were concerned about the destruction of the canon, there's nothing that says you can't read Caesar anymore. It's just simply like, what are you reading in Caesar? How are you approaching the, your reading of Caesar? How are you looking at these, uh, these texts? And I think um, in many ways, we're, we're kind of broadening our perspective, like, let's just read Caesar, um, but let's think about the context of what Caesar is reading or writing and why he's writing what he's writing and the way that he's writing. What are some of the other evidence that we can pull in to get a broader contextualization of Caesar? So, yeah. Um, but, oh, yeah, uh, th those guys are good for any number of reasons. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I do have one suggestion. Sure. Uh, as far as the teaching of the two languages. Uh, I owe a great deal to the professor who explained to me that five or six semesters of Greek was not going to get me anywhere in the language, but he showed me how using the wonderful little green books of the Loeb Library <laughs> and the grammar <laughs> and the lexicon to mm -hmm. learn how to read Greek. Mm -hmm. And over 35 or 40 years, I actually have managed to do it. 
it, a, a two or three years just isn't going to cut it with that language. <laughs> And it certainly wouldn't with English. You know that very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. In, in other words, it is about how to continue learning. And, very much. And you, we don't expect you to be fully knowledgeable of this language at this point. But this is how you go on, even if you're not going to graduate school. Yeah. And the people coming out of graduate school, they are not polished readers of it either, I can assure you. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, does, it takes years. And, and so much of what we are doing is, is very much what you're saying. It's like we're putting, we're putting students on the path so that they can, uh, they can pick the stuff and, and they can hack through it. And part of the hacking through it is that learning and, and that continual learning process. And that what I like to think of as, as, as exegesis, right? The drawing out of information from the textual, but also the exegesis that comes out of drawing information out of the archeological or the historical context and evidence. All of those things are uh, very critical. Um, and I think they're foundational to um, whether you're going off to you know, an advanced study or in advanced study uh, in, in, in classics or whether your job is now analyzing intelligence for some federal agency. Um, it's all drawing out information. Those are critical skills. Yeah. So, uh, oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. I had the mic. Is it on? I'm really invested. Um, so I wanted to um, sort of respond to a couple of the questions. Because uh, I, I think it's important for people to understand that um, the types of things that you are advocating, that I advocate, that many of our colleagues advocate, um, isn't, you know, when we talk about decentering the languages or like what is the core of classics, no one wants to get rid of the languages. No one wants to stop reading Caesar. No one wants to stop reading Cicero or Demosthenes or Thucydides or any of these authors. Um, it's really about, one, understanding how in the limited time that we actually have access to students, can we maximize their learning experience and how do we actually create our field so that they're going to have things to take with them for the rest of their lives. Do we, is the only thing that we want them to take with them from a classics degree that they can almost read Greek or almost read Latin um, and that that's it, that they don't actually understand the context in which those languages and were produced um, or that they, we've somehow magically improved their English grammar. Um, I, you know, it is one of the side effects of Latin and Greek <laughs> that you tend to learn how to use who and whom correctly. Um, <laughs> we should have a warning label. <laughs> <laughs> warning, you will stop using whom as the subject of the sentence. <laughs> right. Um, but but I, I, I want to, you know, I, I think it's a false statement that, um, that it's somehow an either or. Yeah. That you can either, you know, get material culture integrated into your curriculum or you know you can you, you aren't reading Cicero like that's not the same thing right you can do these things you just we don't have a lot of time yep. um, and I really think too that um, I know that there are some high school teachers here um, I think it's really great when members of um, people who are outside of the field we like to make recommendations to our high school colleagues and middle school colleagues and to our fellow colleagues at other different types of colleges but you know, those people who are working on the ground, they can maybe talk a little bit more to what the challenges are when we mm -hmm. now have. So college juniors are now the first generation of students who have been fully educated under No Child Left Behind. And this has made an indelible impact on what their education was like and what we can mm -hmm. expect in mm -hmm. the college classroom. And maybe it isn't that by the time someone finishes Latin four in college that they have read the Procaelio or the Catalinarians anymore. Um, the world, mm -hmm. the landscape of education has changed and the needs of education have changed as well. And we shouldn't be educating students exactly the same now as we did in 1950. We need to evolve our field to or evolve with the world. Or 1980. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I don't like to be critical of my colleagues at all. I think that my colleagues at the high school level and people at state schools, people at small colleges everywhere, you know, we're, we're trying to do what we can with the world that we are inhabiting. Um, and I'm never gonna criticize, um, you know, anybody because my kid didn't get to read Cicero um, in, in high school. I, I put my kid quit after 
the second semester of Latin in high school, so, <laughs> so I can't say anything at all. Um, and I, you know, so I, I just want to lay it out there. That I just want to say that I, I think we need to understand that the landscape has changed and it's adapt or die <laughs> uh, as it is. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Turn it on. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, the green light, the green light. See, I'm exaggerating. Uh, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> sorry, you all had to experience that. <laughs> um, I adored your lecture. I thought it was so compelling and interesting and obviously comprehensive. You obviously put a, long t a lot of time and thought into um, trying to figure out how we can best modify the discipline and make it accessible to all people who have interest in classics, not just the small percentage of people who study Latin and Greek who want to go on to higher ed. And I really sincerely appreciate that. Um, what I was curious about is that you spend a lot of time in your presentation talking about how we can foster um, diversity and education in classes for um, diverse opportunities after mm -hmm. classics, not just as like the direct path to professionalism mm -hmm. in academia. Um, I was curious if you had any thoughts about how to work, not just down to students, but up and across to professors who maybe were educated in a time where classics was the emphasis as like the culmination of classical studies where like you studied Latin in order to become a professional Latinist or something like that. Um, so, so how to, how to evangelize to my to my colleagues at other institutions? Yeah, like, do you have any suggestions? Um, do you um, have any suggestions I, I about how to um, put the workshop on uh, Facebook Live? I mean, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, like, yes, Facebook Live is a wonderful opportunity <laughs> and seeing like these discussions. But like, if we were to have a workshop where yeah. we were to educate um, classicists on how to best teach this kind of well, stuff, what kind of stuff would you want to include in that? What's most important? Is it different from students or professors or that kind of thing? Uh, she says a really good question. And, and, and I think that goes, it's, it's something that I, I'd actually like to talk to some of the, some of the people who brought uh, to campus this uh, weekend about how are we going to help cultivate um, a, a process and a, and because a, it really is, it's a, it's a matter of changing our perspectives and our value system. Um, and how do we go about making that a thing? Um, I don't know outside of just doing it and then talking about it. Um, and then maybe seeing if other people want to do it too with us and then talking about it and, and seeing if there are other people who are already doing it, but are like five steps ahead of me. I would love to know if there's somebody else doing this kind of stuff, we should probably get together. This is why I think the, the data informatics um, is important because I want to know how Montclair University, for example, is, is hitting it through the roof, right? Our numbers are, we're high, we're, according to the data, the 10th largest Latin program in the country as of the 2016 information, uh, but, our, but we're, you know, we're cruising, right? I don't want to be cruising. I want to be, you know, we've got a good, healthy classics program. I want it to be, I want it to be gangbusters. Um, so, so finding out who's successful, and it's not just a count of Latin, the, the students in Latin and Greek, it's understanding the, the wider parameters of these of, of various programs, like who's putting together a successful thing and let's go do some of that stuff. So until we can get that kind of information, it's, it's really difficult to see, you know, it's very hazy. Um, and we'll, you know, we are prone, I think, as a discipline to say, well, um, Let's talk to the leaders of our, un of our, of our discipline. Uh, so let's talk to the people at the same institutions that we've been talking to for the, as the leaders of our discipline. And why are these the leading institutions of our discipline? Because that's where we got our PhDs from. They may not be the most successful in terms of promoting uh, classics to a wider you know, constituency, but we, we gravitate towards our alma maters. Um, and as much as I love Cincinnati, uh, I love Cincinnati to everybody in Facebook. Cincinnati is awesome. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, they're doing some things that are wonderful, but they're not doing some things. As, maybe they're not, they're not doing as many other things that so good. So, so trying to figure out who's doing the, doing the good stuff, I think is important. Yeah. Jim. Yeah. I very much enjoyed your talk. I don't think I've ever in my life been so aware of the inherent schizophrenia 
of classics as I was when I was thinking about this. And um, yeah, we historians, of course, have part of the same problems that classics have. We are trying to um, teach lessons about the past to understand the present. We are trying to give a skill set, et cetera, et cetera. And at the undergraduate we, level, we do not attempt to do it in funny languages. Mm -hmm. And the fact that classics <laughs> has always had two missions, one to inculcate language skills mm -hmm. and two to learn the lessons from those texts with the assumption that you are reading them in the original languages and with the hyping, the pushing up of the, what's the value added beyond the language, you, you seem to be setting up a rather um, impossible task for yourselves, if I may say so. And this is from the context of, I was deeply enriched by the full year I spent reading the first book, six books of Virgil's Aeneid with my Latin mentor. Mm -hmm. I still haven't read the other six books in Latin. <laughs> and you know, I was an undergraduate. I, it was a full year project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've read the Aeneid in three different translations now and I've probably you know, ultimately gotten more of those other lessons from the reading and translation. So I mm -hmm. guess to end with a question, is the balance right between what you teach in the language, slowly, painstakingly grasping the language and what you read in translation with yeah. your students? Um, well, geez, there's, there's all sorts of different ways in which to, to answer that question. First, I would say that one of our, I think within classics, the main goals that, that we have is in the drawing out of information from the evidence we have from those pasts. Now in history, we've got the same thing. You're drawing information out of tax records um, and diaries and other types of, of, of evidence from whatever period, whatever culture you're looking at, right? But it's that drawing out of information. Um, we're drawing out information from, from these, these complex systems in the Mediterranean, and we've got uh, literary evidence that we, that we draw information out of, but I would also say we've got that archeological evidence that we draw information out of. And then we've got beyond that other types of evidence that we're putting together. So for me, it's really a matter of drawing out that information and what information that you use depends upon the question that you have. So as, as, as I say in, 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 my, in my class, it's like, well, should we do this? So we should do this type of method. What kind of evidence should we look at? It's like, I don't know, what's your question? Um, and so I think for classics, it's, it, and to get to the question of like how much language is important, or, you know, what's the balance? Um, I think my idea is to, is really to focus on those skills of exegesis. So that they have the basic building blocks of knowing how to access the information, whether it's in a Greek text or a Latin text or uh, an archaeological data set. Um, have the building and have the basic building blocks for understanding how to draw information out of that, we've done our job. So how much of, uh, how many pages of, uh, of, of a green book you're reading per day? Uh, I don't know, we haven't had a discussion with this as a department. Um, so I'm not going to, I don't want to, but I, I'm, I'm leaning towards the idea that quality is much more important than quantity. And if you can demonstrate the ability to translate, but also demonstrate the ability to draw out that information, that's the, that's the critical skill that I think we're looking at. Now, two weeks later in our departmental meeting, I'll be, might be completely outvoted on that and I'll be fine with that and I'll live with it. But that's my gut feeling at the moment. Yeah. Oh, we have a question from the, something from Zoom. Yes, this is from uh, Amy Pistone from the University of Notre Dame. Just um, how do you, um, Newhart, envision designing internship programs for applied classics when we think classics can apply to everything? Functionally, it seems really logistically challenging as opposed to what you suggested we shouldn't do and send students to a career center who have the actual expertise and contacts to match students with internships? Question? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, you know, any institution, every institution is going to handle um, internships differently. So when uh, I was director of archaeology, for example, we handled internships in archaeology pretty much through our program. Um, and we'd, we'd line up people uh, individually within our, own, uh, within our own department. And that it was in many ways largely outside of our, um, our institution that has a, you know, a very well-developed career center that can help 
match up people with internships. As we're designing our intern internship program here in Classics, it's very much a partnership with the uh, with our own uh, career center. Um, there are plenty of opportunities out there in the world who are just looking for people who are, you know, engaged and interesting and and um, and want an internship. And so they they just want smart people. Um, and so hooking our students into that system is certainly the things that we want to do. What we are doing though, when we have that internship in classics, is that there is a there's there's a certain list of things that we expect those interns to be doing while they're in that program. They should be reflecting on what are they doing, what are they versus what they were expecting to be doing. Um, but we also want them to reflect on how the various types of things that they've learned in classics is somehow being applied or in some way uh, helping them through uh, this experience. We want them to reflect upon how the four years of playing in the Mediterranean um, has in some way impacted their ability to function within this organization. Um, and so for us, that's, that's the applied classics component. Um, I hope that answers your question, Amy. Yeah. Yes, can sir. I follow up with one? Sure you can, yes. Um, the, the, what kind of um, end product will those capstone classes have? Because that could serve as data, correct? For like, well, how did they make the connection? Um, well, I mean, you know, they're, writing, they're writing their thoughts down in a handy dandy notebook, which goes to the intern supervisor. You know, that forms part of their overall internship grade. Um, but they are also um, expected to give a public presentation on what they did during their internship. Uh, so again, that's also to, that's part of the, you know, presentation, uh, oral skills, communication skills that we want to develop at the upper levels of our, of our program. Uh, but that is also as a way to help uh, freshmen, sophomore uh, students uh, to get an understanding of what you can do um, in uh, in out there with this with this work. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to not to take away from Amy's question, but I wanted to loop back to the earlier exchange because I I don't know that we have to think of it as a schizophrenia in our department. Um, I think that really all of this comes down to the basic question of how do we know what we know. Um, the reason why we need to read Latin and Greek in their originals is because we need to understand what kinds of readings those texts can support because that's the tiny tip of the iceberg that we even have from antiquity. Mm -hmm. And I think the other question that's really related is how, what kinds of arguments can these texts and this data support? So those, I mean, that is the link between learning the languages and talking about data and talking about material culture, but it's also, I think, the biggest connection to outward jobs. I mean, mm -hmm. there's nothing that doesn't rely on knowledge or organization of information. And um, I'm just throwing that out there as, as a possible mm -hmm. uh, unifying thing. I really, I really think it's all part of the same set of questions, and yeah. they're the most essential questions in, in human existence, right? Yeah. Well, and I'll, I'll say the most frustrating thing to me that, that, that happened um, during my career in in the field is all of a sudden i mean all of a sudden i was known as an archaeologist and i was like yo dude what the heck i've been reading latin and greek for i don't know how many years now all of a sudden i don't know latin what what are you guys doing put me in the box you know i i that was that was really hurtful to me um and so i i don't like boxes because for me i do see it it's it's this <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just it's the continuation it's like uh, you know what's your question and then you find the information that is going to help you address that question. Yeah. Um, I just do want to add to that though, but in terms of striking the balance, right? Again, we have students for maybe two or three years at the uh, undergraduate level. And if we're servicing that 70, and I actually think the percentage of students who don't go on to graduate school is more like 90%, not 70. I think it's the majority of mm -hmm. the students that we teach and, and the vast majority. Do we shape our majors for that 10 to 15 percent or do we shape our majors for the other 85 to 90 percent? And I think we should be shaping if, if we're really classics for all, we should be shaping it to the 85 to 90 percent. And we have to understand that other fields do philology in translation too, and using English language and dissecting their own language just as well. Um, yes, we want students to be able to draw out. I mean, I couldn't do my job if I wasn't, you know, hadn't been studying Greek for 25 years, right, and Latin. But also, um, I can't expect my students to deal with the text at that level with three semesters. Mm -hmm. I can teach them the skills, but I can also teach them the skills in translation. And 
Um, so I think we do need to think about that balance in terms of, especially at an institution like mine, which is very small, we have three tenure lines in our department, um, and we have to somehow service everyone and still maintain enrollments and, um, you know, what classes fill and what classes don't, right? And so I, I, I love the languages, but I think at the end of the day, if I want my students to also get the material culture and get the archaeology, it has to be more, the major can't be 70% language courses and 30% courses in translation or in material culture or something. It needs to be even maybe a 50-50 or even hmm. flipped the other way. That's um, just, that's a survival mechanism, but also a reality of who we are servicing. Uh, and, and that actually training ourselves to teach students using translations better. I think a lot of us fail at that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and just, but one more little afterthought, I would add that um, we've tried to do this kind of, um, this kind of work and connect with alumni and have them talk about things that classes do rather than what can you do with classics. So we're trying to do something similar, but there's always a student after one of these sessions that comes up to me and says, oh, that's too bad because I thought that being a classics professor would be one of the options that you guys talked about. And, and then they look at me and they're like, you know, because you seem pretty happy with your job. <laughs> and I just want to add that, like, I think that it's right um, of us to, to open the field and to talk about all the many things you can do. But mm -hmm. I think we shouldn't forget to include, like, being us in the realm of possibilities because it's kind of intrinsically a little maybe patriarchal or a little... Um, uh, I, I think there's there's still a kind of mm -hmm. gatekeeping that happens even as we prepare for a wider audience. I think we have to make sure that helping people up to become the next us is still on the table and that yeah. we're not kind of antiquating ourselves in our attempt to guide students to yeah. the food on the table. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I, I would say that we, we, we got that one down. <laughs> we, we got that. Yeah, but but I think you're right in saying we not we should not lose sight of the fact that yeah okay this is a viable and it's okay it's fun, huh? It's not off the table, and yeah and that's going to that's going to depend upon i think that also is going to depend upon the, the size of the program so for a place at a small liberal arts college then that then yeah there's a lot of personal mentoring that that can happen at a larger institution you're going to have more scale issues you might have not one or two but three or four people who could be at that point so it, it uh but there's yeah it's certainly a and that's one of the reasons why i'm very frustrated by our lack of data. So I can't talk to the people who are like me. I can't see them through the veil of the entirety of a classics program. I can see them very clearly in the in regards to our Latin and Greek programs. So I'll let someone else ask a question before I do. You and Darcy. Well, Okay, um, I suppose this is a logistical question then that is maybe not answerable and that's totally okay. Um, but when you were talking about internships um, and the necessity of integrating classic students into related but mm -hmm. not necessarily related directly disciplines such as like a classicist doing classics internships versus a classicist doing like law internships or something like that. Um, obviously, I, I totally agree with you that it's necessary for classicists to do these things. Um, would you imagine that that integration in the curriculum would be like a second or third year um, component versus a capstone senior year course? Or would you imagine that's like an after school program that like Eta Sigma Phi or Classics Club offers as an opportunity for students to go if they have the time? Uh, this, this, is, this is a part of the curriculum. This is, this is, a, this is, a, this is a straight up course, number one. Uh, and um, unlike, let's say, a capstone, the, the, our classics 401 capstone thing that you do in the fall of your senior year, blah, 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 blah. Now, internships, spring semester, I'd say, junior year, because what you're looking to do, or during the summer, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to develop an experience that you can put on your CV that you're going to then use in the fall and spring to get a job. And you need that experience on the on your resume so you can say I've been you know I interned at such and such a place uh, last spring and here's what I did 
Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a high impact experience, um, but you time it in such a way so that you've got that, so you can capitalize on it. Yeah. And, I would also say with internships as well, and, and, and part of that development of, of you know, building out those types of career opportunities, the, our alumni come into, into the game very critically because uh, when we talk about the fact that you can do anything with the class experience and people come to my office like, I want to do X, um, all right, somebody in, our, somebody in our alumni have already, they've already done that. And so if you have a good alumni database and good alumni relations, you can, you know, somebody comes in and say, I want to do X. You can say, chink, chink, chink. Okay, here's three people who have done X. Let me give them a call. Let's start the network. And um, that's, I think that's a very critical element if we want to, uh, to break through into this new, new ways of doing things. Okay, we got a battery problem. Yes, for me, the idea of learning Greek or Latin as, as an expert, just to, learn, to become a, a reader of mm -hmm. Virgil and all those other classics and stuff like that can be pretty scary. At times. Oh, it's terrifying. <laughs> yes. However, by, by, by looking at, by following in your execution, the impact of those same classics in so many different areas, you know, from social justice and blah, blah, blah. But I, I think, however, it would probably be very important to at least show the importance of those especially Latin and Greek on a practical level. Mm -hmm. If I, for example, I, I'm a witness to that as Latin, my little piece of knowledge in Latin and Greek, very, very tiny, but how they have helped me in, the, in, the, in the, my learning of French and Spanish mm -hmm. in terms of semantic and lexicon. And I think sometimes teachers, I think the uh, the, the first speaker earlier has said something about the importance of teachers being a little more helping students, not too much, put so much load, make them, make them, make mm -hmm. things look so terrifying to repeat your expression, but at least show them the different levels in which one can learn certain things, not to be, you know, a very, you know, I don't know, to know so much, but at least on a practical level mm -hmm. to show students as the world is, be is becoming smaller and smaller, I think even in businesses, in social science, so many disciplines, students, American students especially needs to be more acquainted to foreign languages. Mm -hmm. And Latin and Greek particularly, I think, are a tool very important to reach that, that yeah. goal. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, um, we have this experience here at the college, our students who are doing the AB classics and they've learned a couple years of Greek, a couple years of Latin. Now they're gonna now move into language three, take German or French. Um, no offense to German, any German or French uh, professors here, but they're bored. They're very bored in those classes um, because they have their, their linguistic abil ability to, to study and process languages at a very high level. They can go much quicker than the average Joe um, in, terms of, in, in terms of acquiring that, that, that information. Um, so certainly there are, there are very practical skills and there's very practical, I mean, there's good data out there that people who understand an inflected language have a, higher levels of verbal and math scores on standardized tests and all these things. Um, so that's always a, a, and I think 
when I, at least to the extent that I've been speaking with people in the elementary, middle schools, secondary schools, that's a, uh, that's a selling point um, in terms of like, you want your score to go up, or why don't you put in some Latin? Um, but I'm, um, I'm always somewhat uneasy about making that full present on, on the, or the full argument on that basis alone, because I don't want these civilizations and these cultures and these systems to be seen as just a stepping stone to, to something practical. Um, I think it has practicality, practical, practical application in of itself. Um, that just makes the acquiring of other things um, all the more easier. Yeah, but it's, uh, I think um, some of the, one of the largest miners or other groups of people taking Latin here at the college are actually the computer scientists because it, it helps them with the logical organization of everything. 